All right, so this is the third and final lecture about the female reproductive tract, and in this lecture we're going to be covering the cervix and the vagina. So the cervix, it's the most inferior part of the uterus, and it's in this diagram it's indicated by this region right here. And what it does is it connects the ith isthmus of the uterus uh, directly to the vagina. And just a key thing to note here is that the cervical diameter, so the length of the lumen here, is closely monitored during childbirth because it gives an indication of how labor is progressing and gives you an idea how um, close the mother is to actually delivering. The parts of the cervix is, so first we have the internal os, which is just kind of, os is just another word for uh, opening, and it's the junction of the cervical canal and the uterine body, so the uterine body and then the um, cervical canal here. So the cervical canal could be thought of as this kind of this section here, this luminal section uh, passageway here, and it's between the internal os and the external os. And then the external os is the opening of the cervical canal into the vagina. So it's kind of like a tunnel or a tube. And then so you have the internal os, cervical canal, and then external os here into the vagina. The endocervix is the upper portion of the cervix. So this region, kind of right here, if you were to kind of almost divide it in half, so this would be endocervix. And what's important to note about the endocervix is that it's simple columnar epithelium, which makes sense because it's closer to the body of the uterus, which is also simple columnar epithelium on its luminal surface. Um, and then you have the exocervix, which is the lower end here. So this is exocervix here, this lower portion here. Um, and this is what's visible on vaginal exam. So when you do a speculum exam and you, speculum exam and you examine the uh, cervix, this is the area you see. And it also, the luminal surface here on the exocervix is non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, which is the same epithelium that covers the vagina. So it makes sense. It's, it's continuous with so the vagina, has the same epithelium. Endocervix continuous with the uterus, has the same ep ep luminal epithelium as the uterus. Now, the, the important con clinical concept here is the transformation zone, which is the junction between the, ex the exocervix and the endocervix. So the, the, it's, the transformation zone is kind of this in, this in-between point here, which is um, kind of in the name. It's, a, it's where you have this transformation from simple columnar epithelium in the endocervix to stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium in the exocervix. So that's the transformation zone. And this is the zone during where you do, if you do the screening test at pap smear, this is where you want to be taking cells from because this is a common location of um, cervical cancer or cervical neoplasia. And we'll talk about that in subsequent slides. Just to talk about the clinical ap applications of the cervix. These are very high yield, often te uh, tested on uh, board exams, even class exams. Um, so cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, what is that? Well, it's abnormal growth of the cervical epithelium, so the, this part here, the epithelial or luminal surface, and it's potentially pre-malignant. So the key here is it's not malignant. Now, if you go through your pathology textbook, it'll talk about the various stages that this goes through from a pre-malignant phase all the way up to where it actually transforms into a malignant tumor. And the, whole, the key thing here is kind of an infection uh, tie-in is it's caused by the human papillomavirus. So that's why getting HPV vaccines are important because you get the HPV vaccine, you help decrease the risk of getting the HPV virus, which then would give you uh, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, which then puts you at risk for uh, getting cervical cancer. Now, to talk about cervical cancer, cervical carcinoma, this is a very invasive carcinoma. Again, why that HPV vaccine is very important. And it arises due to the kind of the pathological progression of cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, which then develops into cervical carcinoma. It presents as vaginal bleeding, especially after intercourse, so postcoital bleeding, um, and then also cervical discharge that would occur after um, intercourse. Some risk factors are obviously the HPV infection, as we talked about. Smoking's a big and it's kind of a heavily tested risk factor, um, and then also risky sexual behavior. The most common cause of uh, death is when the tumor is in the wall of the uterus here, and it advances and progresses to the point where it compresses the ureter. Now, remember, the ureter kind of runs down through this way, just adjacent to the uterus, and if it compresses on the ureter and prevents um, flow of urine through the ureter, 
It can cause a, bre a backflow and then hydronephrosis in the kidney, which then results in subsequent renal failure and then death, unfortunately. Now, a pap smear, this is a screening test. It involves kind of sticking a, sticking a, a, long, a brush on the end of a long um, instrument here. And so what it does is it's kind of a brush in here and what you do is you spin it around and you help and it collects the cells especially from that transformation zone that we talked about which is again um, that point of change in epithelium so you have the change from the simple columnar epithelium into the uh, stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium and this is a, a high this area is especially at high risk for developing uh, malignancy so you want to collect cells from there they're examined under the microscope, and what you look for is precancerous changes in the cells in this area. And really the goal of this screening is to catch them when they're at this um, cervical intraepithelial intra neoplasia phase. So that phase before it's progressed to the, car the cervical cancer or cervical carcinoma. So what you want to do is you want to catch it at when it's at this stage and then, and then treat the patient and prevent them from reaching this stage here. Now that we've uh, covered the uterus in entirety, we're going to talk about the, the vagina to close out the lecture. Um, the vagina is a muscular tube that extends approximately 10 centimeters from the cervix to the external gen genitalia. So um, in here, external gen the labia minora and labia majora extending from the cervix. It receives the penis during intercourse, and it also helps assist the sperm to transport it to the uterus to help with uh, ensure fertilization. It serves as the birth canal for a newborn during delivery, and then it's also a passageway for uh, menstrual, menstrual fluid and tissue to leave the body during uh, menstruation. So the vagina, when it connect connects with the cervix, it forms um, four recesses superiorly. Um, and first, you have the posterior fornix, which is indicated here in the label, and it's kind of this recess here, and it's just adjacent to the recto-uterine pouch or the pouch of Douglas, as we've talked about in previous lectures, so right here. Um, and then you have the anterior fornix, which is here, and this is an, uh, just adjacent to the vesico-uterine pouch, which is, again, that fold of peritoneum that creates this pouch here. Um, and then there's also two lateral fornices. The two main, clinically, the, the two major ones are these po are the posterior and anterior, just because they're adjacent to these two pouches uh, formed by the peritoneum. Uh, the neurovascular supply. So the blood supply is really uh, via both the vaginal and the uterine artery. So, you, so the vagina really has a dual blood supply. Um, the more proximal part is supplied by the uterine and then more distally by the vaginal arteries, both branches of the uh, internal uh, iliac artery. The venous drainage is via the vaginal venous plexus, which then drains into the uterine vein, and then lastly into the internal iliac vein. And then the lymph drainage from the vagina is to the iliac and superficial inguinal lymph nodes. So if there's a tumor or an infection within the vagina, it's going to spread to the iliac and the superficial inguinal lymph nodes. So keep that in mind. We always try to cover these lymph node spreads because this is a frequently tested topic on board exams. Um, so it's good to know your lymphatic drainage. Uh, so the superior um, part of the vagina re receives nervous innervation from the sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers, which are going through, again, that inferior hypogastric plexus, which is the main uh, central area for the ANS and then in the pelvis, and then also after uh, via the pelvic splanchnic nerves, so those two uh, routes right there. Now, the inferior part of the vagina, which kind of is closer to the skin and, the, uh, and forms the external orifice here, um, that receives inter somatic innervation from the deep perineal nerve, which is a branch of the pudendal. So the sensation out in this region, because it's more closer to the skin, um, where somatic innervation occurs, that's why you're going to have a somatic nerve, the perineal nerve, which is a branch of the pudendal. So some clinical applications. Uh, first, vaginal carcinoma. It arises from the squamous epithelial lining of the vagina because the vagina is lined by stratified squamous epithelium, non-keratinized. It's usually related to HPV. And if it's in the lower, if, if it's from the lower one-third, it goes to the inguinal lymph nodes. Um, so the low, so a cancer in the lower one-third. If it goes from, if it's from the upper two-thirds um, of the vagina, so this region here, so if we were to kind of go like this, the upper two-thirds here will go to the regional iliac nodes versus down here, it'll go to the inguinal in the lower one-third. Episiotomy. This is a, a surgical procedure used during uh, childbirth, during vaginal delivery, and what it's used for is it's kind of the 
uh, obstetrician will make an incision um, posteriorly towards the anus from the vaginal opening. And the idea is to kind of enlarge the birth canal or enlarge the opening here to make it easier to uh, help deliver the baby through. And then once the baby's delivered, then the uh, obstetrician will go in and suture this shut. Vaginal fistula, this is a significant complication that occurs. Um, it's what it is is it's an open communication between the vagina and an adjacent organ. Now the vagina is loca located adjacent to the bladder, the rectum, so it can form fistulas with many different um, organs in the area. Um, it's most often caused by prolonged child labor because the baby presses against the vaginal wall that limits the blood supply. So if you have the vaginal wall and then the baby's head here is kind of pressing down and compresses it the blood supply it can't get through so if this is your blood supply it can't get through what that leads to is um, ischemia and then you get necrosis as a result of that and the necrosis is what uh, what is what increases your risk for create it leads to a weak vaginal wall and then that's what leads to an increased risk for fistula formation now Depending on which organ it is, it can form a vesicovaginal fistula, vesico for bladder. So you can have a connection here um, between the uh, bladder and the vagina. And how that presents is it is the patient will complain of urine flowing out of the vagina. Um, you could have the rectovaginal fistula, so kind of forming a posterior connection here with the rectum. And what happens there is you can have stool flow out of, out of the vagina on presentation. And then you can have a urethrovaginal um, fistula. So you have the re urethra here, and you can have a fistula forming between the urethra and the vagina. And what happens here is urine only enters the vagina during urination. So it's only coming out. It's not coming out of both orifices. So really the urine will come down here from the bladder through the urethra, and then it'll just exit through the vagina. Vaginal fistula, this is a significant complication that occurs. Um, it's what it is is it's an open communication between the vagina and an adjacent organ now the vagina is loca located adjacent to the bladder the rectum so it can form fistulas with many different um, organs in the area um, it's most often caused by prolonged child labor because the baby presses against the vaginal wall that limits the blood supply so if you have the vaginal wall and then the baby's head here is kind of pressing down and compresses it the blood supply it can't get through so if this is your blood supply it can't get through what that leads to is um, ischemia and then you get necrosis as a result of that and the necrosis is what uh, what is what increases your risk for create it leads to a weak vaginal wall and then that's what leads to an increased risk for fistula formation now depending on which organ it is, it can form a vesicovaginal fistula, vesico for bladder. So you can have a connection here um, between the uh, bladder and the vagina. And how that presents is it is the patient will complain of urine flowing out of the vagina. Um, you could have the rectovaginal fistula, so kind of forming a posterior connection here with the rectum. And what happens there is you can have stool flow out, out of the vagina on presentation. And then you can have a urethrovaginal um, fistula. So you have the re urethra here, and you can have a fistula forming between the urethra and the vagina. And what happens here is urine only enters the vagina during urination. So it's only coming out. It's not coming out of both orifices. So really the blood urine will come down here from the bladder through the urethra, and then it'll just exit through the vagina. And then lastly, we're we'll talking about cholecentesis, which involves insertion of a needle through the vagina, and then you go through this posterior fornix here. So you insert the needle, poke, th uh, make a poke through the posterior wall through this fornix into the pouch of Douglas, which is this again. If we draw this line to represent the peritoneum, it's this um, pouch in the peritoneum. And again, this is where um, fluid or infectious content within the abdomen and pelvis can collect. And so you would stick this needle through, put it between the uterosacral ligaments, which are you know, connecting the uterus back to the sacrum here, and then you aspirate out the fluid that's collected here, and then you, you know, for different laboratory tests to help with making a diagnosis. And that concludes our discussion of the female reproductive tract.